I can invite you back to your chairs. And you can, as you make your way there, if you're there, you can open your Bibles to the book of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah chapter 40. If you're new to the Bible, Isaiah is, is just past halfway in the Bible. So if you open to halfway and kind of go right uh, in a fairly short period of time, you'll bump into a book called Isaiah. If you don't have a Bible, there's Bibles in the back. You probably benefit from having it because we just walk through a passage of Scripture as our normal practice of preaching. On a Sunday morning here, we just look at the Bible and we talk about what it means. That's basically what we, we do for the second half of our service on Sunday mornings. I'd like to read this second half of this magnificent chapter. It's one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, and I've been looking forward to preaching it this morning uh, precisely because of the situation we find ourselves in as a country, looking ahead to Tuesday and asking what, what do we most need to do in preparation for the vote on Tuesday, that the thing we most need to do is look into God's Word and where should we look in Isaiah 40 came to mind. I think you'll see why. We're going to begin in verse 12, halfway through the chapter, and we'll read through the entirety of the chapter, and then we'll jump in to study it for application this morning. Let's begin reading verse 12 of Isaiah chapter 40. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. Who has measured the spirit of the Lord or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge, and showed him the way of understanding. Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket, and are accounted as the dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor are its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing, an emptiness. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness compare with him? An idol, a craftsman casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and casts for it silver chains. He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will not rot. He seeks out a skillful craftsman. He just set up an idol that will not move. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord 
is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Isaiah the prophet of God, lived during a time when God's people were facing exile from their homeland. The Assyrians, the great and mighty nation of Assyria, had already conquered their brothers in the land of Israel. The tribes of God's people had been divided for many, many years. And they were basically just a small pawn in the way of these mighty empires in the Middle East. So if the Assyrians had come and threatened them and God had actually rescued them through mighty acts over these Syrian conquerors, but they were facing exile when the Babylonian Empire would come in. So this is the times that Isaiah is living in. The love of God, the worship of God had not been popular for a long time. There was a long line of rebellion and wickedness present in God's people. And they would soon face exile where they would be tempted to assimilation, to the obliteration of their religious identity. And the temptation was to look away from God to all the frightening changes in the surroundings of their community, their culture, the impending doom of exile from the inexorable power of Babylon, and to ask questions. Does God know about me? Does God know? have the ability to care for us. What will happen in the face of this overwhelming cultural and political antagonism? What are we to trust in? Where are we to look? Now, I imagine over the last few years that a number of Christians in our country can relate to Isaiah's situation in a way that they have not been able to previously. If you're like me, reading the prophets of the Old Testament has often been a sort of foreign experience. It can seem at times like their situation is just out of touch with the world I live in, the kind of extremes that they faced. Not so much anymore. You're like me, this last political cycle has featured the full range of shocking, bizarre, and downright frightening revelations about the state of our culture. If you're like me, you're noticing a level of frantic commentary taking place in the media in preparation for the vote on Tuesday. And even in in considering the vote, I know many, many Christians who felt a sense of hopelessness, displacement, confusion, uncertainty. What is going to happen? How do I even participate in what's going to happen? What am I supposed to do? I've heard more Christians ask that this election than I've ever heard asked that before. And if we're honest, our anxiety is not really tied to just one candidate or another, regardless of who wins all of us are aware that there's a a sense of displacement that's been growing, a sense of accelerating cultural change. It began before the election. It seems certain it will continue after the election, regardless of the results. There's a sense that a, a, a different future is rushing towards us than we've experienced before, and it's rushing at a faster pace than we've experienced before. It's been over the last few years that Christianity has gone from being a bastion, even a political force, to facing even pariah status. What once was commendable to have a moral code based on the Bible is now not only weird and strange, but increasingly dangerous and denounceable and by some interpretations, illegal. 
what once seemed impossible to have professing Christians call evil good and good evil has now become commonplace and in many cases close to home. To believe in a single way of salvation is considered outrageous and arrogant. To believe in the holiness of God and the kingdom of God and the authority of God is now almost a crime in certain instances in our country. It seems entirely likely to me that biblical Christianity will continue to be scandalized in this country however the election goes Tuesday. I've heard Christians wonder aloud about the future what will be the case for our children. I think that we can relate to Isaiah in a way we've never been able to before. So what do we need? What do we need most right now? What do we need to do? What do we need to hear? What do we need to think about? What activity should consume us? What vision should we consider? Well, I think we need to learn from Isaiah. In this book, immediately after announcing that the Babylonians were coming, that they would take God's people into exile as a result of their sin against God, and they would live in exile, that they would face this situation as a people, Isaiah turns the corner and he begins to speak for God and declare a comforting vision beyond any imagination to people facing even worse than we are anticipating. What do we need? What do we need more than a Christian political candidate? more than an accommodating culture, more than a guarantee of American moralism, more than a guarantee of religious tolerance. What do we need more than any of those things? We need a vision of the greatness of our God and a trust that his greatness is displayed in unending goodness towards his people. That's what we need. That's what God thinks his people need in moments like this. That's what God says we need. We need a trust that the infinite God displays unending care to his people. That's what we need. The reality is God's people have always been exiles and sojourners in a land not their home. It just feels more like that now. The people of God, and I think this passage presses us in this direction, need to see and trust. They need a vision of infinite power and they need to trust that it's displayed in unending goodness. They need to trust the infinite God who will not stop doing good to them. That's what they need. Now, Isaiah, in this section of this chapter, basically divides it into, into two main categories. The first is that we need to behold God's infinite greatness, and the second is that we need to believe his endless care. So he makes his case somewhat like a, a lawyer would that leads to an inevitable and inescapable conclusion. This first lengthy section from verse 12 down to verse 26 is just a series of comparisons where he basically sets up a number of comparisons that all point to the infinity of God, that God is beyond any calculation, that his power and his greatness are beyond the highest heights of our imagination. And so he compares one thing after another, after another, to build this inevitable case. And then that leads to his conclusion and his exhortation that in light of the power of God, we must believe that he is able to do good to his people. So it begins by beholding God's infinite greatness. Let's just walk through some of these comparisons. And, and the point of all of these is that we would just be beholding. We'd just be watching. We'd just be enjoying God through Isaiah, pointing out how great he is. The first comparison is a, a comparison to this world, or you might say to the greatest measurements of this world. So a comparison to this world is the first thing we behold. How do you, how do you define infinity? <laughs> how do you define it? How would you define it? 
Well, one way you can define it from a literary standpoint is to describe the greatest things that someone can imagine and then compare those to the smallest things that they can think of or they can relate to. And that's what Isaiah does here. He asks a question, and he does that throughout this passage, and these are obviously rhetorical questions. The answer is only one person. No one else, only one, is the answer to all these questions. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? So again, what's he doing? He's taking the biggest things he can imagine, and he's comparing them to an insignificant measurement. So he says there's, there's only one who can measure the waters in the hollow of his hand. Now, now this would have been phenomenal for Isaiah. It's even more phenomenal when you think about what we know about the size of the globe. Isaiah's scope was somewhat limited to the, the Middle East, and, and even he would have been undone by that. The Sea of Galilee in the hollow of his hand. Now, God doesn't have a hand the way we do, but he's, he's anthropomorphizing. He's describing it in ways that Isaiah can understand. If God did have a hand, he could measure all of the waters in the hollow of it. He could scoop them up and it, none would fall out. I looked up just because I was curious about the waters. 326 million trillion gallons of water on the earth. I was thinking about some of the catastrophic floods we've had over the last 15 years, the tsunami, and I thought, you know, that's just the earth just twitching slightly, not even like shivering. I thought that's too big an image. If that happened, everybody would be dead. It's just twitching, and there is so much water that a continent can't contain it all. It just floods over a whole subcontinent or over a city, and people cannot take that much water, and people die. It's catastrophic. That's just a, a twitch of the tectonic plates, just twitches, and there's more water than we can possibly handle. And it says God, he measures all of the waters in the hollow of his hand. It says he marks off the heavens with the span. That's just a hand's breadth. So imagine Isaiah looking up at the night sky. Just unfathomable, mile upon mile upon mile of space. And God says, I measure that with my hand. Who needs a ruler when you're talking about something that small? He says he encloses the dust of the earth in a measure that, that might be labeled, it's some kind of uh, cu cultural word, a third. It's, it's the third of a measurement. We might think of something like a, a pint. He encloses the dust of the earth in a pint. The dust of the earth, the sands of the Sahara, the coastlands of the continents, he encloses them in a measure, it says. He measures the mountains and hills and scales and in a balance. You know, like those scales you have at, you know, H-E-B or Sprouts? You pile up your eight apples on there to see how many you have, how many pounds. You throw them on there, you pick them off, you notice how... That's what God does with the mountains. The Rockies and the Himalayas, beyond our comprehension, their weight... And he just tosses them on a scale. Behold the infinite greatness of God. The point here is not just that God is bigger than the biggest. The point is that our biggest scales of bigness are on a different level entirely. Our biggest bigness is small, is insignificant to God. It's not just that he's bigger. It's not just that he's taller it's that he's on a totally different plane of greatness. He's not just the tallest guy in the room. He holds the room. The comparison to the biggest things in the world. Second comparison, we'll move swiftly through these. He's compared to all wisdom. Notice there it says, Who has measured the spirit of the Lord? What man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult? Who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? The commentator John Oswald helps us with the point that Isaiah is making here. It says, The spirit, reference there, the spirit, uh, who has measured the spirit of the Lord, is the sum total of the interior life including the volitional, affective, cognitive aspects. 
It means the will, the heart, and the mind. Who can accurately comprehend that aspect of God and so tell him what to do? The point is, nobody can do that. The point here, he says, continues, is surely to deny the existence of any counselor, whether human or heavenly. The answer to the rhetorical questions in verse 13 and 14 is that no one has advised God either in the creation or in the administration of the world. No one has advised God ever in the creation or the administration of the world. The point is, no one can teach God. No one ever. No one has, no one can. So crucial for us to feel the point of this. When we think about, for example, Tuesday and our debates, what's the best, how do we think about something like this? What's a moment in our nation? What's needed for the future of the world? What's important? God says, I need no counsel. I need no advice. There is no one who can counsel the wisdom of God. His wisdom is complete. You cannot add to it all the wisdom that is to be had, God has. Imagine the confusion of an Israelite thinking about the future. Imagine that confusion as he thinks about the future. And this horde of Assyrians that wiped out their neighbors and the Babylonians that are coming on their way. Imagine that confusion. Oh, this is so powerful, so great, so mighty. Imagine. Imagine that God says, no, there is, there's no one that can compare with me. No one gives me any counsel. No one has any need to counsel the Lord. He's compared also to the nations. Notice 15, verse 15, it says, the nations are like a drop from a bucket. What a, what a phrase. The nations are a drop from the bucket. They're counted as dust on the scales. The, the point is that the nations themselves, the, the nations, the greatness of them, their, their cultural glory and their, their accomplishments and their apparent power, all of those nations for all of history, they're similar to a, a bucket being carried and a single drop drops out. The point is you wouldn't even notice it. You wouldn't notice it. The commentator Oswald says this, What are the nations so impressive in their glory and earth-shaking in their power? They are the drop of water falling back into the cistern as the bucket is pulled up. They're the speck of dust on the pan of the balance scales that does not even cause the scales to flutter. Neither is a cause for a moment's notice. Now, Obviously, this is relative comparison. God's not saying he doesn't care about the nations. He's not saying he doesn't rejoice over what he's made. This isn't some statement that God is indifferent to what goes on in the world. No, it's, it's relative comparison going on here. So compared to God, the greatest power and accomplishments of the earth are like a drop from a bucket that no one would notice. They're like dust on the scales that you don't bother to wipe off because it doesn't cause a moment's consideration. We need this. We need this vision. When you watch news media, I watch some, I watch news media, and you just hear people talking about power, apparent power, hidden power, manipulation, crowd sizes, influence. God says, okay, add up all the power you can imagine, then add that up from every country around the world, add up every accomplishment, every world record in the Guinness book, add up every reward, award that's ever been given of the Nobel Peace Prize, add up every piece of literature, every piece of art, every accomplishment in music, every accomplishment in painting, add up all the glory and the power and the might, add it all up. And you know what it is? Compared to me, it's like a drop you don't notice that fell out of the bucket. What is the Mona Lisa compared to the Rocky Mountains? What is a, a nuclear bomb compared to the sun? That's the point. There's no comparison. He 
He keeps going. He keeps wanting us to behold. He compares it to false gods. There's thick irony in this passage from 18 to verse 20. He, he says, look, look at these nations. Look what they're doing. They're, they set up these little wooden idols and they say, this is our God. It will save us. And there's just irony in here. He says, would you compare an idol to me? A craftsman casts it. I mean, the irony is thick. The one who made the world is watching while a man builds something so that he can worship it and trust himself to it. A goldsmith overlays it with gold. They cast for it silver chains. It says, he who is too impoverished for an offering. In other words, I think there's some it's kind of sarcastic language here. Like he doesn't have enough money for an offering, but he's going to pay for a person to have a skilled craftsman who can craft this idol. And the goal of the idol set up, here's the big goal, so that it will not move. I mean, you feel the irony? You've got to know the irony of the scriptures. Here's the big goal of human idols. We, we, we really think we can get it so that it won't fall down. That's going to be our God. That's our God. That's what we're going to trust in. We're going to get it so it doesn't break. Peak idol making is the non-breakable, toppable idol. That's the top of the line. The irony is thick. God is mocking the foolishness of this thinking. And of course, we don't have typically pagan worship in our country, but the same irony goes for any kind of idolatry. Most of us have never seen someone worship a little idol though that is present in the world today, but all of us have seen people devote themselves for physical things who are just as vulnerable. Cars run out of gas every few miles and have to be recharged. They break down in a short period of time. Houses leak, foundations crack, jewelry gets lost, relationships fall apart. Let's think about idols and you can insert appropriate sarcasm. What things are you looking to that you have to sustain but that you're hoping sustains you? That's the point here. You have to sustain them, but you're hoping it sustains you. What about a bank account or a job? You have to sustain it, but you're hoping it sustains you. God says, ridiculous. Now, if that's all you have to trust in, that's maybe the best you can do. But he says, you know better. Verse 21, do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning it is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. His next comparison is to the people and the princes of this world. He compares the people, he says, they're like grasshoppers and the princes are as nothing. What a comparison. Again, the goal here is that we would behold the infinite greatness of God. He wants to take our eyes off the small and see that which is truly big, off those things that we think are significant to the one who is significant. He says, look, God spreads out the heavens like a tent. As easily as a man sets up a tent. Now, I think men find tent setting up fairly hard, but most men, you can get it done, you know, maybe an hour. God sets up all the heavens with that much ease. He just spreads it out like a tent. He says, people, they're like grasshoppers. I, I, apparently, this year was good for um, crickets um, because there's crickets everywhere, all right? And I went over to the Ikea shopping center with my family one day, and I was just a little bit nerved by the number of crickets, live and dead, that were there all over the place. It was just good family cricket time, apparently, this uh, summer. So th there's crickets everywhere. And they're hopping around, and, and they're just, there they are, and some of them are in piles, dead, next to the trash can. And there's some hopping up the walls, and God says, if you want a comparison with the impressiveness of people in comparison to me, check out the cricket. All of the people of the world, you know what they're like? Just a pile of hopping crickets. Isn't that so different from entertainment tonight. Oh, check out this person. Check out that person. Check out this bank account. Check out this accomplishment. Check out this power. Check out this power room. Check out this deal. God says, crickets. Just hopping crickets. Vulnerable, squishable crickets. 
it just sets us in the right frame of thinking. We're prone to exaggerate the small and minimize the truly big. God says, set your heart the right way. He brings princes to nothing, it says. He makes the rules of the earth as emptiness. A big zero is what God makes the princes of the earth. It says, scarcely are they planted. Scarcely is a good word there. When it says, scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth. It's almost as though Isaiah is saying, it's as though you plant them, and the moment you plant them, they're gone again. The moment you sow them, then all of a sudden they're gone. He blows on them, and they wither. I planted, I turned around, there they were, they were gone. Compared to God, the mightiest in the world are scarcely planted, and they're gone. Now, I think we need this looking into Tuesday. As I said, I, I've heard Christians that have agonized in this particular election. I don't, I, I'm struggling with the candidates, and I, I, I'm just struggling in a way I haven't before. I don't like this, and so forth, and, and they're just wrestling and wondering what's going to happen, what's the result going to be, what about the Supreme Court, and, and I understand there's a, there's a nobility in voting, there's a gift that God's given us in voting in this country, I encourage people to vote. However, we vote in a context of Isaiah chapter 40. Whoever wins Tuesday they fit in the category of verse 24. Scarcely planted, he blows on them and they wither. Gone. Whoever they nominate, scarcely planted, gone. Whoever they put into positions of power, scarcely planted, gone. So yeah, I think voting's important. I just think it needs to be considered in a context. Here's the greatest, mightiest leaders in the world, like a weed that grows up and then it's gone. Do they have a job to do? Absolutely. Should we care about who's there? Absolutely. Should we desire God-fearing leaders? Absolutely. Should we pray for that and do appropriate civic responsibility? And should some Christians even work in politics? Absolutely. But sometimes the church forgets the context of world civilization. It is relative. It's important, but it's relative. It's relative importance. And sometimes in this country, because there has been an unusual amount of Christian influence in politics over the centuries, we kind of forget that relativity. Christians in China are very clear on this point. We are not. We tend to assume, no, there's, there's, a, there's a huge importance. There might even be an all importance in who the leader is. God says, it's important, but let's bear in mind, scarcely planted and they wither. We need to bear that in mind. Another passage in Scripture says, Stop fearing man in whose nostrils is breath. Of what account is he? Crucial that we see this comparison. Final comparison, God compares himself to the galaxy. Who will you compare me to that I should be like him, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name and by the greatness of his might and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Not even one. Imagine Isaiah, before electric lights, he's sitting out and he's just looking at the Middle Eastern sky. God says, I bring them all out every night. Their orbit and how galaxies work, I bring them out. I call them forth by name. It's, it's beyond our comprehension. I read, just because I think, again, modern technology only increases our awareness of this passage and what it's trying to say. The European Space Agency says, uh, for the universe, the galaxies are our small representative volumes, and there are something like 10 to the 11th to 10 to the 12th stars in our galaxy. There are perhaps something like 10 to the 11th or 10 to the 12th. 
it's crucial to know. 10 to the 11th and 10 to the 12th is a massive difference, okay? That's not a small difference. That's a massive difference. That's the closest estimate they can get, 10 to the 11th or 10 to the 12th. <laughs> Stars in the universe. This is only a rough number. No kidding. As obviously not all galaxies are the same. Just like on a beach, the depth of sand will not be the same in different places. Listen to this. No one would try to count stars individually. Instead, we measure integrated quantities like the number of luminosity of galaxies. Here's what he's saying. The best we can do is say, that one's brighter, it probably has more. <laughs> 10 to the 11th or 10 to the 12th, you're talking about <laughs> zillions of a gap in your knowledge between <laughs> how many there might be and how, well, here's, the, here's the gap, like a zillion trillion stars. 10, 11, 10, 12. We're not quite sure which one it is. No one could count individual stars, so we guess. Isaiah says different. Oh, there's one. Everyone. And he knows the name of everyone. He knows stars we haven't seen yet because the light hasn't reached us. He knows that name. What's Isaiah's point as the lawyer presenting up all these points? What's God's point? Behold infinity. Behold it. Not just the smartest, tallest person in the room on a different scale entirely, a scale of one, his own. What are we to do with this? What are we to do with this? Isaiah has convinced people, I hope, that this Babylonian exile is nothing compared to the greatness of God. Nebuchadnezzar of all his power, he is nothing. Nothing. And Xerxes will be nothing. And Darius will be nothing. And Cyrus will be just a puppet in the hands of the Lord. He says, they are nothing. A million soldiers, nothing. I count millions and millions of galaxies of millions of millions of stars. And I call them all out by name. What are we to do with this? Derek Kidner, the commentator, says there's a right way to apply this and a wrong way. He says this, the wrong inference from God's transcendence is that he is too great to care. The right one is that he is too great to fail. The wrong inference is that he is too great to care. Easy mistake to make. The right one is that he is too great to fail. Now God gets down and reveals he knows the questions in the hearts of his people. He's not so concerned with the stars that he doesn't hear the question in their hearts. And he hears the question in our heart and the question in your heart. And the questions usually look something like this. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord. My right is disregarded by my God. God. He doesn't know what I'm facing. He doesn't care about me. Easy thought for Christians to have right now in our country as we think about the future and legal action being taken against Christians and the possibility of pastors facing indictments and maybe jail time and various things like that. Difficult to think about that. And you might be tempted to think, he doesn't know what I'm facing. Or maybe it's just a personal trial. I'm suffering. I'm weak. I'm sick. I have relational problems. My body hurts. My family hurts. My heart hurts. And he can't know know about me. We have to behold God's infinite greatness. We also have to believe God's unending care. Believe. Believe it. Believe God's unending care. 
Isaiah says, believe it. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. And here's what he does. He gives power to the faint. To him who has no might, he increases strength. The questions call into court the willingness of God to exercise or to have sufficient power to care for his people. God says that I am the Lord. That word is Yahweh. It's his covenant name. It says this powerful God has committed his resources to the well-being of his people. What is God doing with all that infinite power? Well, he's devoting them to the well-being of his people. The Lord, your Lord, your Yahweh, your covenant God, the I am who rescued and covenanted himself with you. He is the everlasting God. So the one who cares for you is the God with infinite resources. The one who cares about you is the God who numbers the stars. The one who carries you is the God who carries the oceans in the palm of his hand. So how can we say, you don't know and you can't care? Isaiah says you can't. He gives power to who? To the faint. What qualification qualifies God's people to receive his power? It's those that are weak. It's those who wait for the Lord. So no strength is needed to qualify you for unlimited resources being dedicated to your care. It's just entrusting yourself to the Lord. Oswald again says, God graciously makes his vitality available to the failing of earth. But does the receiving depend on any particular condition? Only one. And it is specified here, waiting on the Lord. The expression implies two things, complete dependence on God and a willingness, listen, to allow him to decide the terms. To await on him is to admit we have no other help either in ourselves or in another. Therefore, we are helpless until he acts. By the same token, to wait on him is to declare our confidence in his eventual action on our behalf. Thus, waiting in Hebrew is not merely killing time, but a life of confident expectation. Those who give up their own frantic efforts to save themselves and turn expectantly to God will be able to replace or exchange their worn out strength for new strength. How like God, he takes the useless and gives back the good. And we need to understand that this encouragement that even young strapping men will grow weary, but God will give strength and they'll even be like an eagle. The image there is of an eagle stretching out his wings and, and flying on the currents of wind. I think the idea is God lifts them up even as an eagle is lifted up by the wind. And as a result of his strength, they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. These promises of sustaining salvation are part of a covenant that God has given to his people. And that covenant is shown from the beginning of the Bible all the way through to the end. So Isaiah is just reminding people, remember, God covenanted with you. This isn't like a new idea that God will lift up the weak who wait on him. This has always been the case. God has promised if you wait on the Lord, he will lift you up. He will sustain you. He will rescue you from your own helplessness. And then you get into the New Testament and it reveals how and who precisely will be doing this. Colossians 1.15 says, He, speaking of Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, reminds you of Isaiah 40, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things. And in him, listen, all things hold together. Paul knew his Bible. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that 
that in everything he might be preeminent, for in him all the fullness of God, the Isaiah 40, the Isaiah 40 God, all the fullness of that God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace, how? By the blood of his cross. What does this mean? It means the Yahweh of the Old Testament revealed himself. It means the Lord who created the earth and measures it in scales and measures the water in the palm of his hand and counts the stars and makes princes nothing. He's revealed himself. He's shown himself. And in the New Testament, his name is Jesus. He is the image. He's the revealing of Yahweh. The Yahweh who does all these things and then devotes his love and care to his people. The Yahweh who exercises infinite strength to display infinite grace. That's the Yahweh of the Bible. It's Jesus. That's why when those soldiers in the garden came to arrest Jesus and they said, are you Jesus? And he said, I am. That's why they fell to the ground. Because in a moment, God revealed, here's who you're talking to. One who speaks in stars, listen. Catch a glimpse. Here's Yahweh. And here's the good news. (laughs) Jesus reveals ultimately that those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They'll take, he'll take them from failure to victory. It's incredible because in just a few chapters, Isaiah is going to say, here's how God is going to fulfill this promise to his people. There's going to be a servant of the Lord. He's going to reveal who God is and he's going to take on the sins of his people. He's going to be crushed in their place. He's going to lift them up from the grave while he goes down to the grave. So if you're here and and you're not a Christian, this is the good news of the Bible. Not just that God loves those who loves him, but God loves people who have no love in their heart and no help and are fainting like those young men he just described. And God lifts them up to salvation. He carries them like eagles floating on a breeze and he exerts all this power to their rescue and lifting them up so that contrary to their own strength, they can run and not grow weary. They can walk and not faint and walk finally into his arms in the heavenly throne the Yahweh that reveals himself in Jesus used his infinite power to die on a cross in the place of sinners. He used his infinite wisdom to marry justice and mercy while bleeding out on a cross outside Jerusalem. He used his infinite resources to marshal all of creation so that Rome and Israel and the Sanhedrin and his people would ultimately conspire to put him there so that he could fulfill this promise that those who wait on the Lord, they will not finally stumble their way into hell, but they will be lifted up finally to heaven. That is our God. What do we need when we see the Babylonian horde coming over the hillside? When we feel small and weak and faint and weary? There's a lot of good things. Activism, hope for cultural change, desire to see God-fearing people in power. Good things, very good things. Not the greatest thing. The greatest thing is trust that infinite power can be offered to us in unending goodness, especially revealed through Jesus Christ, Yahweh in the flesh on the cross. Charles Spurgeon says, if we are inclined to grieve, because everything around us changes. Our consolation will be found in turning to our unchanging God. Let's take consolation, brothers and sisters. I don't know what's going to happen Tuesday. I don't know what's going to happen next year. I don't know whether God will reverse the course and 
Christianity will be somewhat popular again or whether he'll keep the same course and we're unpopular. I don't know whether we'll eventually be illegal. I don't know that, but God does. And this God promises that he will give strength, saving strength to those who trust in him. Trust in the unending goodness of an infinite God. I'd like to invite the worship team up if they would come. We're going to sing one song just to close, but let me pray as they come up take their places. Lord Jesus, we find in you infinite resources and surprisingly infinite resources dedicated to us to renew us, to strengthen us. Lord, in the first place, to save us and then to carry us to the end. And I pray, Lord, that you would fix our eyes on you. I pray, Lord, that you would lift our gaze to you, that you would cause us to exult in you. Lord, I pray wherever there has been any temptation, Lord, and I, in my own heart, Lord, there's anxiety and temptation about our culture and about nominees and candidates and elections and, and so forth, Lord. Wherever there's been anxiety about that, Lord, I pray we would, we would put that next to you and remember your power, your greatness, your rulership over the nations, your complete sovereignty. Lord, I I pray for every person, anybody who who is heading into a voting stall on Tuesday, Lord, I pray that this vision of your greatness will be most on their minds. Lord, anybody who Tuesday night is is feeling anxious, Lord, for whatever reason, Lord, I, I pray this vision of your greatness would be most on their minds. Lord, we trust you. Lord, do good for your people. Do good for our nation, we pray. (laughs) But Lord, fulfill your power and do good to your people, we ask you. We thank you. In Jesus' name.